Well, hello, everyone. This is Brad Boyson talking to you, and this is HCM Impact. And we are continuing with our series of weekly discussions and interviews with game changers, people who have been involved with the Human Capital Reporting Standard, ISO 30414, almost since its inception. And we've got a really wide range of global participation in this discussion so far. And joining us today from Germany is Hilger Pothman. Hilger, welcome. Brett, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's a wonderful project. And, you know, just sort of uh, off, off script, I want to thank you for all that you've done to get this project where it is today. It's, uh, it's something that so many vested stakeholders around the world have been working hard for for many years. And I know that you're one of the central contributors to this. So on behalf of me personally, thank you. Well, don't make, don't make me, um, don't make me, uh, don't make my face turn red now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I'm humbled, I'm humbled by this, but by, I'm also humbled by um, the great progress that we've made. Absolutely. And, you know, the wonderful stakeholders that involved and one of the reasons we're doing these interviews and discussions with these influencers around the world is to raise awareness to raise the tide of awareness about this particular ISO standards and its implication in the world of work, the world of business and the world of HR. So probably the, you know, where we've started with everyone else is just maybe if you don't mind doing a bit more of introduction about your background and how you became involved with this project. Uh, more than happy, Brad. Um, well, my name is Luger Botman, as you mentioned. I've been working for Deutsche Bank for ages, many, many years, um, more than 30 by now. Um, and um, well, actually, I've been servicing uh, as, a, um, as an HR business partner in different countries, uh, different, um, different divisions of Deutsche Bank, uh, my, my long-term employer. And um, while I have been um, working for roughly 12 years in the investment banking field, in Toronto, in New York, in London, and also in Frankfurt, in Germany, um, it, it occurred to me that um, you know there must be something more than just counting um, heads and cost when the investment banks you know are doing assessments, be it on the equity or be it on the debt side. So, and occasion and, and uh, funnily enough, I was attending a conference by Dave Ulrich from Utah, you know, he, from his home, and he is a um, you know, worldwide well-known, you know, management guru for HR and other things. And uh, so Dave has been basically um, uh, leading this uh, conversation. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I spent, um, I spent a couple of weeks at uh, Michigan and I was trained by him and Wayne Brockbank. Um, and um, what has occurred to me is um, Dave's continuous focus on the stakeholders of HR. Okay, and back in 2007, in this conference with 350 paying participants in a conference in Munich, he was on a huge video and for two and a half hours talking, you know, with his overhead projector going this fast speed. And then he stopped, he paused at a moment where he said, and there's one stakeholder group that HR has really missed on addressing, and that's the investors. Nice. So I so so in 350 people room, there was there was a, there was thick floor. You could have heard a needle drop because people were so focused on listening to Dave Ulrich. Mm -hmm. And then he was saying, well, he was giving the whole speech about the um, the uh, shift in intangible value. You know, uh, the the difference between market value and earnings having dropped, and that's already in 2007. Uh, right. significantly from 90% point correlation at the times uh, when the markets were still, you know, blow, uh, glowing and, uh, and expanding to um, nowadays, sometimes below 30, even below 20% points, right? Yeah. So there is no reliable reliability anymore when it comes to, um, when it comes to um, predicting um, anything from a, from a, share price or from a stock market perspective, again, be it on equity or on debt, even the rating agency side, I would add them to the stakeholder group. So, um, the, so the intangibles have overtaken the tangible information when assessing companies by far. Mm -hmm. And that's been the case for many, many years. Yeah. So um, since 2007, I've been scratching my back 
um, or the head, my head uh, to figure out what would be a good way to give the investors and their rating agencies, but also globally mobile talent and politicians when it comes to labor markets, how could we get them some comfort, some grip on getting an, a view on these human capital? Like most companies don't have anything but human capital, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hence, they have no idea on how to measure this. Yeah. So I've been, you know, at the time, I've been discussing this phenomenon with investment banking participants, right. with rating agents, with equity research analysts. And the common theme that I got back is you guys in HR need to define and agree on what you are talking about, starting with very, very simple things. What is a headcount? Define a headcount. Is it, is, it, um, is it counted or is it measured on the first of a month, on the last day of a month, on the average of a month? Because three times, no governance, three times different results. Absolutely. Is it reliable information? It's yeah. no reliable information. You can just, by virtue of this simple, um, simple point, you can you can imagine, you know, what kind of um, what kind of um, reliability was there, and from a perception perspective, by the uh, by the investors and by the rating agencies, nothing. Yeah. You know? So they kept on just counting people no matter when and how, you know, just counting people, counting costs, and maybe training, you know, but what is training, you know, how is it defined, notwithstanding the fact on what is leadership, yeah, and how is your succession pipeline when the first two or even three level of leaders and senior people in the firm just, you know, leave? What is your dependency on externals? So all of these things, including diversity, everything on the HR agenda um, is, has not been governed. So that's well, you, you said something earlier to get into the game. Yeah, I mean, you said something earlier it, that this resonate, has resonated with me for years. And I just don't think it's been appreciated enough. And you mentioned that others, others looking at HR said to you, you People working in HR need to get your act together. You need to speak a common language, define your terms, and, and you know, stake your claim to your professional territory. Because right now there's divergence, people use different metrics, there's there's, you know, and it's all sort of based on this idea, this sort of philosophy that these things can't be codified, they can't be standardized. And I, I think one of the common themes, Hilger, that I've seen in the people that got involved in this project early on is that they've entered the human capital, the HR, this space with a bit more of a business, even finance background. And, you know, I, I also thought of something you said earlier about sort of the, the shift from tangible to intangible assets. And again, I think it's sort of like that uh, expression where you have the 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 frog in the boiling water, you know, if you do it quickly, they notice it, but if you do it slowly, they just sit there. And this didn't happen overnight. You know, this is over a period of 40 or 50 years that slowly, you know, the intangible assets have been the wealth creation, the value add to the majority of organizations. And I think that's been part of the reason why there's a blind spot for a lot of people. So you've been involved in this, this um, HCM impact project for a while what was what was the you sort of gave the foundation and the purpose of how you got involved in ISO standards but what's the role of HCM impact well uh, first of all you know I've been um, part of the very small team of initiators of this ISO project um, together yes. with Lee Webster uh, who worked for um, for Sherm and ANSI at the time um, and when we um, finally gotten um, 22 countries to agree, all participating countries to agree back in, you know, at the end of 2018 on this ID, um, ISO 3414, um, there was, um, there was a, a question of, um, you know, is it now, there's a German phrase, uh, uh, you, you read it and then you punch hole it and then you shelf it. OK, mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a phrase that doesn't probably translate well in English, um, but uh, that's not good enough. We didn't produce these um, guidelines so that they are being filed somewhere in the Internet. Yeah. Uh, so the, the reason why 
a group of maybe five people who have been developing this together with me, yeah, namely Sahid Mubarak, um, namely Lee Webster, Jeff Higgins, um, uh, and, um, and Stephanie um, uh, Becker and Nico Dierhoff, some others I probably forget now, who have been in the midst of this, right? Uh, for, for five years developing time, we thought, well, there's more to it. And how do we get the word out? We have no marketing budget. So we are just intrinsically motivated to, uh, to, to implement um, these guidelines. So we, um, we um, had a call every week and we talked about, um, you know, who's doing what and have you read this? And there were numerous uh, uh, newspapers approaching us for articles, et cetera. Um, you know, speaking on conferences, et cetera. And so that's how we got together. And one point very early on, early, I think it was last year, I asked Jeff Higgins, well, Jeff, you are a professional human capital markets um, uh, person with a, with a company. Um, if you share your contacts and what you're doing uh, with these other people that we have contact with, isn't that kind of um, hurting your business model? And Jeff was laughing at me and he said, well, so to, but not, he didn't say that, but he meant like young man from Germany, right? Um, <laughs> uh, a, ra a raising tide lifts all boats, okay? Yeah. And that is not the consulting industry. This is right. the human capital markets, yeah. okay? So the tide for the human capital markets is increasing with a global network of experts. And that's the purpose that we're trying to accomplish. That's why we have um, in, uh, in, in, in several, not all countries um, globally, um, enthusiastic people like yourself, Brett and others who are, um, who are banging the drums for this, okay? Right. Uh, who are getting out on video, who are getting out on conferences with articles, um, doing business with clients, you know, the big four, like the Ernst and Young, the KPMGs, the Deloitte's and the Price Waterhouses, they haven't been there when the um, IFRS was invented or when right. the um, when the financial measurement thing was that was invented. I don't know even when that was. Okay, so um, it is okay and it's legitimate that these industries now start to develop and pick up because it is a market that needs to be covered, and um, you know. There are companies who are starting to get certified and there are more to follow. And uh, now we have to get word out to the investor community, to the rating agency community, but also to the talent market. And um, most, in, most um, appealing to me sounds the discussions with the governments, nice. um, because if you want to position your labor market appropriately to, um, to succeed in the war of talent, you need to demonstrate the power of your um, employment system, okay? And that is easily benchmarkable with applying ISO 3414, okay? So um, if the German governments and they have been sponsoring our activities since 2009, okay? So they are in it for the long run because the German labor market is a very good one. Um, and uh, we wanna make sure that global talent in uh, Dubai understands the best jobs they are in Germany. So here's the here's the game. Here's the it game is. now. It's such where a, are the best jobs work yeah. worldwide? Yeah. No, it, and I have my own story, you know, and I think that's the raise the tide type of mentality is that several years ago, I was doing a project with one of the GCC governments. I won't mention their name. I don't have their permission to talk specifically. But as you mentioned about the role of government. This government in this region, governments here are a bit more interventionist than perhaps some parts of the world. And what was happening was a consolidation of different government entities. And I was doing one project on some human, comp human capital and competency development. And then because of my background, they came and talked to me and said, you know, we're doing this other project of standardizing our IT system. And we need to bring together all these agencies. And the person said to me, you know, they, they all use different measurements. And I was like, yeah, they do. And it was like, how do we fix that? And I'll, I'll be honest with you, Hilger, at the time, and this is three, four years ago, I said, you need to learn about this ISO standards project because this is not a new issue. And there are like-minded people around the world that see the benefit of, of creating sort of a, a a ground floor. You mentioned the IFRS. You know, I, I remember several years ago reading a book on accounting and finance. And I think the, you know, the IRF 
IFRS moment, gap moment, without those agencies or entities happened, you know, in the 1500s in Italy, when they discovered double bookkeeping entry, right? It's like, ah, you know, here's the external and internal reporting and the value to Absolutely. everyone, all the stakeholders in expanding it instead of just keeping track of these numbers. And I think HR human capital, we're at that tipping point right now with all these stakeholders what? aligned to benefit from exactly what you're describing. Yes, I couldn't agree more, Brett. And, um, you know, uh, usually things happen when there is a crisis, when a real when real bad things happen you know systemically etc and um, not to talk about the crisis that we're in right now not to talk about what happened in 2008 etc um, but um, we are in the midst of a crisis because the stock market doesn't know what he what it's 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 an it right what it's evaluating right yeah, yeah. so the stock market is taking bets on um, on intangibles okay yeah. without yeah. really knowing what is the the substance of it. And um, so although there is no explicit crisis because it would basically kill all markets, right? If somebody would say that, yeah, there is no crisis, I'm not saying that, but as an HR professional, I would say there is a crisis of missing on the upside potential. Yeah. So if we were able to um, benchmark the human capital of let's say the German DAX, all the 30 top, largest companies in Germany, if we were measuring their um, or, or benchmarking their human capital with their respective global peers, right? Like Allianz with all global big insurance companies, like BMW with all large, you know, motor companies, etc. cetera, then um, we would get a boost of, um, of uh, precision in the assessment of um, companies that this world hasn't seen before. But how do you get such a momentum going if there's no painful, dramatic crisis on your heads? So it's, it's basically intellectually important that people understand the concept. And then it's kind of a um, chicken and egg situation. And who is the first mover? You know, if you are driving on a train, well, the front of the train, the very first, you know, part of the train, it is muddy, it is ugly, it has yeah. scratches all over it. Um, that's how it feels to be part of this, mo of this, um, of this group um, because there is um, quite some resistance. There is accusation of too much uh, bureaucratism, uh, of too many costs associated, et cetera. So the nuggets of the value of human capital benchmarking has not really um, been appreciated by relevant market participants. And we have to cross that bridge, you know, we have to get people to understand and then start working with that information in their own um, evaluation models. So this is not a commodity business. The definitions that 3414 has prepared, that's kind of the pavement, okay? That's the pavement. And now each equity research analyst, each asset manager, each rating agent, each, each credit risk officer of a, of a firm, of a bank, right, has to take that information into their models and then looking what the strategic context is in the company situation. So let me pause here because otherwise I start talking for No, no, I think we all do that. Everyone I've talked to so far is once you get into their... Um, as they, I don't know if it's an American or British expression. I think it's American. And they're into their wheelhouse. The wheels keep turning, yes. and they just keep going. Yes. And and even yes. you know, likewise for me, when I listen to you and I learn from you, and I think about my own career, and I studied finance first academically, and something you said just now really resonated with me. One of the reasons I transitioned from finance to HR is really getting a a detailed foundation on the technical side of finance, you realize that that's just sort of the, the entry point. That's, that's what really happens and what others do, the competitive advantage and all of that unique is all about what people do with their people, with their teams, with their leadership. And that was like a eureka moment for me, you know, over 20 years ago is, is cause you know, I thinking business, going into business, finance is the language of business. 
And, and to this day, I don't think enough people appreciate the, the, the wealth, the power that's unleashed by what we're describing. But as you allude to, there's a lot of status quo that doesn't want to change. There's a lot of um, businesses that benefit from what I will call the current bureaucracy. And um, like you say, it's, it's a rough ride to be at the front of the train trying to smooth out and create the, you know, the industrial, the industrial industrial area than the road that or the, the role that the railroads played in industrializing yes. different parts of the world. We're doing that with intangible capital right now. And it's not easy. I right. wanted to, I also wanted to get some insight from you in terms of, you know, as challenging as it may be to be in it right now, where do you see it going? You know, and you've alluded to it, I think already, but, but maybe for some people that would benefit from a vision from someone who's in your position right now, what does the near future hold? How would you describe that vision? Um, well, near future and vision doesn't go hand in hand. Uh, sorry, I don't want to be kind of uh, funny here, but um, uh, my vision, of course, is that um, the human capital assessment um, by external stakeholders, and that's including globally mobile talent, government, governments, um, referring to the ESG uh, movement right now. Um, by the way, this topic is much more about the G than the S. Most people associate human capital and human resources with the yeah. S. There's certainly some S in there, but the key thing is, is the G. So um, where do I see it going in the short term, spanning the next uh, 24 months? Um, the um, uh, the familiar familiarity of the markets will increase significantly. Um, and that is done by um, more and more companies uh, getting certified um, according to ISO 3414. And these companies are making noise about it. They tell their investments, their key stake, their, their investors, uh, their key stakeholders, and make sure that people understand, wow, why do these companies like Deutsche Bank, like DWS, the asset manager, both global players. Um, so people are asking, why do you kind of spend money and and attention to this. And they all share the same story, okay? We want that the stakeholders appreciate the great work we do with our people because we need and we continue to, to want globally mobile talent. We want the best talent, you know, that's, that's in it for large corps. We want good relationships, competitive situations with the government. That's in it for large corps, okay? We want um, fair treatment when it comes to assessing our equity and our debt by the respective external stakeholders, rating agencies, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of upside potential um, to get a grip on um, the benefits for large corps. Now, you will probably ask me, what is in 24 months a, um, a small cap, like take a, um, take a printing company with 80 people, 80 people, where the owner and his wife, well, the wife obviously being the CEO, um, understand everything because they can basically um, comply with ISO 3414 with a white piece of paper, with a cup of coffee and some candies on a Sunday afternoon and just spend a couple of hours ticking the boxes and filling in the details. Now, why would they do that? Well, they want to buy a new six color printing machine. That machine costs you a million something. Well, US dollars, Euro don't, don't matter. Now they go to the bank and the banking clerk in two years time, the, the credit officer, they would say, well, what's your, what's your ISO level? What's your ISO 3414? Whatever that thing is called, you know, it will probably have, a, have an own brand by then. And then the, they will key in the information and then they will benchmark that printing company within a local, a regional, maybe a Germany-wide benchmark. And then they will come up with the cost of the credit. And if this printing company does a good job with their people, high morale, good pipeline for, for succession, um, good training capability, no accidents or little accidents, whatever, 
and everything makes sense to the strategic situation of that company. Well, that credit officer will probably give them a big relief on the, um, on the interest rate. And we're talking big numbers that this printing company can reinvest in whatever, probably in human capital. So it's a positive, you know, it's a positive circle. It's not a vicious circle, but a positive momentum that's built. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, so, so that's of course for, um, for small caps, because many people say you, are, you only cater to the large corps who are on the stock market. No, it isn't, you know. Um, we cater to um, the uh, master student leaving the university in Dubai, yep. Yep. okay? Yep. We want that person, that woman or that man to do a little research and get a grip on, okay, where are companies with a nice and, and transparent compliance with ISO? And imagine a very strong, top ranked student asking that question in their interview, yeah? So the company, Goldman Sachs is desperate to hire that kid from university. And then that kid from university is saying, and how about um, this ISO 30414 standard? How are you treating your people? Where's this going? And then he said, well, you know, you put, a good, you put up a good Goldman Sachs story or, you know, take whatever company you want. But you can't tell me anything about this ISO thing. Well, I kind of um, have a go at somebody else mm -hmm. who are not putting up as good show, but they can tell me how they deal with their people. Okay. So this is the medium term future that we're heading. And of course, it is leading towards the vision that we have um, of having uh, human capital um, being at minimum as important as financial results. Um, when you are um, running your company. Well, I, thank you for sharing that story. I'm personally thanking you and I hope others benefit from it too because this is exactly to me what raised the tide and human capital impact is all about is mm -hmm. I'll share with you. You know, I was teaching a class one month ago in Saudi Arabia, obviously virtually. And I've introduced this standard into my people analytics course already. And I asked them almost rhetorically, once I gave the high level overview and it wasn't a deep dive and it you know, wasn't any case studies, what they thought about this, you know, and I framed it a bit in the context that, you know, what's happened in the United States with the SEC and other things. And Hilger, they got it right away. Like it, they just, mm -hmm. they, the lights went on and they, they thought about how the comparables work between industries, between, you know, and this is things that finance has happened for decades decades and decades and the the power that's Absolutely. there and and the other thing that your comment got me thinking about was this you know in terms of um credit scores if you will i i literally just watch a documentary or you know the the entertainment mentuaries that they have now on netflix the other day about the the history of money and one of the one of the sessions was talking about you know credit scores and how that evolved mm -hmm. you know, and and the traditional model and how it was so incredibly biased to white working males like it was all of mm -hmm. the criteria that was in there was just that's who would get credit and it had so much bias and prejudice against other groups and you think about in terms of human capital and hr and I got to thinking what you're saying about maybe in the future, we have some equivalency that's like a net promoter score for human capital. Absolutely. There's so much talk yes. globally about the value of net promoter score. It's not holistic. It doesn't mean everything, but it's valued out there. And if we can take these human capital reporting metrics and aggregate them in a way and have some history that demonstrates the value add much like happened in the areas of uh, engagement, you know, 10, 15 years ago when people were just sort of measuring some soft things and then they could correlate engagement with organizational performance. If we do that on a yes. broader scale, wow. Absolutely. And, and I think the challenge we have is that some people just get it right away. You know, I, t I tell the story, I met Lee Webster on the streets of, of New Orleans in 2009 and knew right. that he was That's in when charge. I met him. Yeah, and he was in charge of this new project that was coming up in the US with ANSI standards and HR. And I just introduced myself. I was just a member and I said, how can I help? I don't know you, I, but I know what you're doing. And just tell me, I may live thousands of miles and kilometers away, and, but 
I'm in, I get it. And so for a decade, I think we've had this group of people who get it very quickly, but we're trying now to expand that ecosystem, to expand the message and the vision that you're sharing now. And I just, I'm very cognizant of our time too, Hilger. And I wanted to sort of frame the last two questions in a way that makes sure that, you know, if there's anything else and, and maybe, you know, what is something about this project that isn't talked about enough that should be getting more attention from your point of view? Um, as always, good question. Um, that's when the um, person who should answer the question needs some time to think about it. I'm, um, I've been on there too, so. But, <laughs> but there are two things that come to mind. Um, mm. And guess what? Um, that's not from the perspective of the financial service industry. That's from the perspective of what is happening in this world right now. So first of all, you know, um, why do we have an ESG movement? Okay. The world is changing significantly and we have to provide um, metrics and, um, and guidance on how to save this planet. That's really high up strategic and vision, whatever, right? Um, and the um, human capital reporting piece is contributing to some extent to, to, um, to give this moment or this movement some predictability mm. on assessing the future development, okay? Because it's not about money. It's not about earnings. It is about what are you doing to make sure that your company will be there in 20 years from now or 30 years from now? And what are you doing that your employees or your, sh your shareholders and, um, and the society is gonna be there, right? Um, that's one big picture thing that's currently very tangibly changing. And all parties, all participants in the market are, are latching onto that. Um, and the second piece coming down to earth is, um, talent that is at university right now and maybe the ones who have left uh, in the in the last few years but the the future of companies or of the society are children are students at universities not only students uh, you know not only university students are the future but you know especially those who are dealing with this um with this topic right um they are not joining employers anymore because these employers are squeezing out the, la the last, um, the last um, profit out of their business to make money and work seven by 24 so that the first 10 uh, working years, you never see the daylight. These days are over, okay? Um, globally mobile, bright people, they look for meaning. And the 3414 in its true and, and good sense is helping to provide globally mobile talent. If we just focus on that key, key uh, stakeholder group um, with the tools to develop meaning, okay? Because on the one hand, um, they understand what's going on. And on the other hand, they're looking for ways to, to get autonomy and influence over this. And if you put those two things together, understanding what's happening in this world, and then combining this with autonomy and what is my personal role? How can I engage? Where do, what, where do I want to develop towards? That creates meaning. And the 3414 guideline that we just, uh, you know, are working and talking about is just providing a mechanism, you know, to help this. It's, you know, again, as I listen to you, I, I, it just triggers so many realities. And one of them is I live, as you mentioned, in the Emirate of Dubai in the country of the United Arab Emirates. And Dubai introduced a global nomad visa recently, targeting mm -hmm. just the talent you're referring to, right? And mm -hmm. I think back, this is something 20 years ago that would get my ears up, you know, that would say, and I've seen people on social media who've already moved into this sort of global nomad space. So the, you know, the traditional model of the expat probably, which you saw a lot in, in your career is, you know, working for a large multinational and spending 10, 15, 20 years. But 
this global nomad is going to move from place to place based on opportunity, based on where they're able to live, where they want to live. And I don't think a lot of stakeholders appreciate the, the fluid nature of that talent. And this is one of the ways to identify that trend. So um, final thoughts, Hilger, anything that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to close out with? Uh, well, if you have a couple of more hours, we can continue. To count <laughs> it's on always that. the case. It's always the case. <laughs> um, but I think we have touched on some key aspects. And um, since this video shouldn't um, shouldn't be a lecture, but just you know, transferring or transferring some of the excitement about the future, not only of this planet, but especially of our function in HR, yeah. but also as a investment investment participant in the marketplace. You know, yeah. spanning. Yeah all kind of industries. Um, I hope we covered some, some points that you could work with. <laughs> oh, indeed. And I, I've said this at the outset, part of, you know, the, everyone that's on this is a technical expert, but part of what we want to share with people, stakeholders, the community is the passion. Because for people like right. you and I doing this over 10 years, it, it has to be passion or you wouldn't be doing it. And we want to capture that and we want to share that energy with people and we want to get them involved. If people want to get involved, Hilger, do you have any recommended sort of resources to point them to? Uh, yes, um, besides my own email, um, I'm just kidding. Um, I would prefer <laughs> people, I, I, would, I would prefer, well, and um, you know, this is not for the tape, but you know, I personally have no Zippo economic benefit from doing all of this. I strongly believe in this vision. When I retire, when I, when I kind of, you know, leave this world, um, I want to make sure that this vision is alive. Okay, so um, now, who can they contact? Well, it's the hcm minus impact.com. Uh, because um, then uh, they own, they, then they just not meet you and me, they meet all the experts um, at the same time, and they can choose by the bios, uh, by the publications, etc. Some, some research on, um, on um, hashtag ISO 3414 in LinkedIn will guide them. Uh, and um, that's probably a good bet to start with. Wonderful and wonderful place to close out. So on behalf of myself, my colleague Fahad here in Dubai, Hilgarwan, thank you for your time and, and effort and genuinely appreciate what you've done for this project and leaving an impact for the world. So with that, I close things out. Thank you again, Hilger. Bye from Dubai. Thank you, Brett. Bye-bye.